Teşekkürler Eren. Teşekkürler Yeliz. Ee, evet iki günlük bir maratonun son oturumu ee, ama emin olun çok keyifli e, ve çok güzel bilgilerin paylaşılacağı bir oturum olacak. E, oturumun konusu Octagon pazarlama ve global yayın hakları ile alakalı olacak. Ve iki tane çok önemli isim bu konuşmayı ve bu konularla alakalı bizimle paylaşıyor olacaklar. Octagon... E, Bildiğiniz gibi dünyanın, yani Yeliz'in dediği gibi dünyanın en büyük sports marketing şirketi. 50 tane ofisi var, 22 ülkede yer alıyorlar ve bir sürü sporcuyu, Michael Phelps gibi, Simon Biles gibi bir sürü sporcunun da aynı anda temsilciliğini yapıyorlar. Bugünkü konumuz katılımcılar dolayısıyla İngilizce olacak. Dolayısıyla şu andan itibaren... İngilizceye geçiyor olacağım. Uh, welcome everyone. Today, um, Jeff Meeson, Managing Director of Octagon Europe, and Daniel Cohen, uh, Senior Vice President of um, Media Rights Consulting, will be joining us. But before I hand, that, hand them the word, I would like to give a brief introduction. Uh, Jeff is leading Octagon's uh, business across all Europe. He is overseeing six regional offices and he is working more than 80 clients. Uh, some of those clients are Accor, Cisco, Expedia Group, Mastercard, Shell and PlayStation. Uh, he has been in Octagon for more than thir uh, 13 years and he's been building Octagon's portfolio since then. And his brands include uh, Coca-Cola, Cisco, Delta Airlines, General Mills, and Taco Bell. Daniel Cohen, um, he he's leading Octagon Media Rights uh, consulting practice with a portfolio of five billion dollars of media rights under his advisory. Daniel possesses 18, 18 years of experience working with sports properties, spanning from technology media and finances. Welcome, gentlemen. You look uh, great. How are you? Good afternoon. We're doing great, Amir. It's good to have you here. Uh, thank you for sparing your precious time for us. I know it's the end of the year. I, it's been very busy for you. And um, I know that you have prepared an amazing presentation, uh, which will talk about Octagon and some of its business and some insights from the industry. Um, I don't want to take too much of your time, so I'll leave the word to you, Jeff. All right. Thank you, Amir. And uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to share a little bit about Octagon, uh, highlight some of our work from what has certainly been um, the most unique year, I think, in all of our careers. Um, before we get into this, we're probably all obligated to share a bit of a story around uh, this crazy year. And while, uh, as Amir mentioned, I've, I've been at Octagon for, for over a decade, I'm still relatively new to this role. Uh, I had the privilege of, of moving to London with my wife, and at the time, a, a three and a one-year-old on February 17th. Um, so if you if you dial back to where you were on the 17th, you'll, you'll realize we had uh, about 30 days uh, in London before the first national lockdown happened here. So maybe not the best way to start a new job uh, in a new country. And uh, I have to share, I have a, a, a very vivid memory of a dinner conversation with my daughter, who's the three-year-old, and, and she had just one question. Uh, Dad, how come nobody lives in London? Um, which is just a, a, a crazy telling time. But we've, we've made it through. Uh, the business year, at least, uh, and it's been great to look back and reflect on, on just some of the amazing resiliency that our people, our agency, and, and our industry at large uh, has demonstrated over the past 10 months. So uh, let me share a, a bit of background about Octagon, and today uh, I'll, I will focus on uh, our marketing practice. As Amir mentioned, we have a, a large talent representation business as well, um, but today we'll, we'll focus a little bit around the marketing side. Um, and then we'll get into three areas that really have demanded our energy and resources uh, over the past year with, with, with respects to COVID. So at its core, uh, Octagon is a, a global creative agency and we specialize in sport, entertainment and culture. Uh, we're a team of more than 800 very curious problem solvers in more than 40 offices around the world. Um, we're part of the, of the Interpublic Group, 
which is an ownership structure that has always provided us with a competitive advantage. But uh, I would argue uh, in, in these trying times uh, and, and the financial realities of this year, uh, e even more so. We think about our offerings on the marketing side in, in three key areas. Um, we have a, a, our partnership services area, and the focus there is, is what I would refer to as the more traditional commercial elements. So finding the right properties for our clients, the right platforms, making specific asset recommendations, and, and ultimately helping to negotiate deals. Uh, our campaign services really bring those partnerships or platforms to life through award-winning creative and, and content work, uh, and also through channel planning and distribution of that work. And then finally, uh, the production side. So we, we produce a wide range of, of experiences from traditional ticket management and hospitality programs uh, to retail and, and things like experiential activations. And we perform these services on behalf of um, what I'll call the best client roster in the industry. This, this is without question the slide that we're most proud of as an agency. And our tenure with some of our biggest brand, with, with some of the biggest brand and sponsorship spenders in the world is, is truly unmatched in the industry. Uh, we've worked with MasterCard for over 25 years, Coca-Cola, AB InBev, and Cisco for 10. Uh, and just recently, over the last couple of years, we've been retained by Expedia Group and Shell, among others, to, to really help grow uh, and build their partnership marketing efforts. <laughs> Of course, things changed a bit for all of us this year in 2020. Um, sports were all but canceled for two months, and when they came back, things, things certainly looked very different. Um, and really, when thinking about this last year, we really saw significant shifts in three areas. Uh, one, partnership value. Um, you know, should partners continue to pay the, the full rate of their sponsorship contract, given the realities of cancellations uh, and, and now games without fans? Uh, two, brand activations, first movers and brands that can find and continue to find relevant ways to, to provide value to consumers and to the properties retain their competitive advantage. And third, the media rights side of it. So I'll, I'll let Daniel certainly speak to this area. This, he, he, is, he is the expert in this space, but clearly the world of, of media and broadcast rights uh, has been and, and is still very much impacted by the realities of COVID. So we'll get into each of these here a little bit, and we'll start with, with partnership value. Um, I've, I've grabbed a couple of in, images that if, if you've watched a football match over the past six months, you, you should be pretty familiar with. Uh, clubs added TV visible signage inventory over their seats to help offset the lost partnership value. Um, over the past 10 years, Octagon has, has conducted more than 5,000 sponsorship propo proposal valuations on behalf of our clients. And as of last March, we, we really put that database to, to good use by building what we refer to as the partnership impact assessment model. Um, and this was really to help our clients, both sponsors and rights holders, to objectively determine how much sponsorship value was lost from COVID-related impact. Um, I'm proud to say we've conducted uh, assessments for 21 clients, uh, and uh, the count right now is, is looking at 105 deals, and we've identified north of, of 100 million in, in U.S. dollars in lost value uh, across the globe. And while one might assume that these valuations prompted some difficult discussions around rebates and, and payments, um, I, I would say one of the one of the great things uh, this year in our industry resiliency is that these negotiations were largely in the spirit of, of good partnership uh, with both brands and properties defining combinations of you know make good uh, new assets including things like this new TV visible signage uh, and at times some financial relief and while our analysts and researchers were certainly focused on the valuation side of the world, uh, our account and creatives teams were focused on finding new and innovative ways to deliver against our client objectives. Uh, a great example of this is, is MasterCard sh shift to virtual player mascot appearances for UEFA Champions League. Uh, MasterCard's signature, signature assets uh, of, of their Champions League sponsorship is the player mascots who uh, traditionally get to escort a player onto the field at the start of the match. And, this wasn't, of course, feasible this year, given, given all of the, the medical limitations, but we weren't going to let that stop us from giving the mascots a priceless experience. I uh, wanted to share a quick video just showcasing this virtual experience, which allowed the mascots to engage with players as, as they entered the stadium from the team buses.
So a, a pretty cool shift um, and some benefits too. Uh, you know, I think in the, in the traditional player mascot model, uh, kids are are really just paired with with one other player. So giving the kids the opportunity to interact with all players as they moved in was was certainly a nice side benefit. Uh, I mentioned earlier that providing values to, to consumers and the property was a key differentiator for successful campaigns this year. And one of our, one of our best examples uh, of this is, is certainly from our, our work on behalf of Cisco and their partnership with Manchester City. So playing in front of empty stadiums has been difficult for players, as, as you might imagine. Uh, the home field advantage has, has effectively been taken away. Um, but through the use of Cisco's WebEx, WebEx technology, we were able to fill the Emirates with, with chants of Blue Moon, uh, giving fans the opportunity to display their loyalty uh, and providing the players with the motivation that really only fans can provide. Uh, I wanted to share just one, uh, the, the first of a suite we produced at the start of the season that um, uh, is one of my, my favorite pieces of content that, that we did this year. Without a dream in my heart Without a love of my own Blue you just what I was there for You heard me saying a prayer for Someone I really could care for And then suddenly appeared before me The only one I was ever before I heard someone whisper, please adore me smile every time I see it. Uh, and of course, shame on me, it's Etihad Stadium, not the Emirates, of course, uh, but we were able to fill the stadium uh, with those with those crowd chants. Uh, and with that, Daniel, I'll, I'll flip it over to you um, to get into some of the media right side of this. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, everybody, and thanks for having me as well. There's a lot to cover. I think we've got about 15 minutes, so I'm going to do my absolute best to cover an industry that's a $60 billion global industry and has been totally upended due to the, uh, the ongoing pandemic. When we typically meet with a property, when we talk about their TV rights, we've got a handful of questions to better understand what are they trying to achieve and how can we move forward. And what you see in front of you, and I won't read them to you, you can clearly read them, but these are some of the, the most pertinent questions right now that are facing properties as they go negotiate these TV deals and these broadcast deals. And a lot of the question comes around, what's going to happen as technology continues to push people away from traditional forms of consumption? And what's going to, how is that going to impact the fees that we so very much adore and need to keep the wheel spinning. So if we look at the next slide, and, and what we're looking at here is really some of the trends just globally speaking. My team breaks down, gosh, uh, well this year we'll, we'll have done about $900 million worth of football media rights deals alone across Asia and Europe and the US. And what we're trying to understand in each market is that TMT sector. 
right? So where is broadcast free to air consumption moving? Pay TV. In some parts of the world, pay TV is actually increasing. Other parts of the world, specifically North America, Western Europe, pay TV is decreasing and being replaced with, as you see towards the bottom there, broadband consumption, the internet. And if you go to the next slide, just painting a general global picture here, there seems to be a theme of some of the countries that dominate Turkey being in there on the, on the um, broadband side, just companies that are consolidating and dominating. So consolidation is another theme that we talk about when we talk to our, our teams and our lead clients about the challenges ahead, but the opportunities as well, that many of these broadband companies are merging into mobile companies and many of these mobile companies are merging into pay TV cable companies. And does that create opportunity? Sometimes. Does that create challenge and monopoly? Other times, yeah, the answer is yes. So if we look at the next slide, we're looking here at just the sheer size. And I apologize, some of these slides are very US specific, but you could talk about sport on, on broadcast uh, or advertiser spend really in any market. But what we're looking at here is just the sheer enormity of the attention, the audience that sports drives, not just for advertisers, but for general population. And even though Facebook and Amazon, Google, Apple, and others are making their foray into sports and more consumer behavior, meaning viewership, attention span, time spent consuming is shifting away from linear television to digital audiences, um, excuse me, digital platforms, as you see to the left and the right, it's still the sports specific, those sports that are grabbing the most of the advertising budget. In 2019 alone, digital advertising overtook television advertising in terms of global spend. So what we often also tell our clients is you can't fight change. So how do we adapt to that change? If we look at the next slide, here we're looking at that, that battle, if you will, between pay television, those that are cutting the cord and moving over to OT, OTT platforms. And the growth of OT, OTT has just been exorbitant. Uh, if we look at the next slide. But forgive me, I, I pulled some slides here from different presentations to try to cover as much as I could. So that's why you see trend three. We've got about 30 trends every year that we track in terms of their relationship to really leagues and teams broadcast and media deals. One of the trends though, is as the pay TV audience is dwindling in most or many markets, other new challengers are coming into the market to say, I'm going to launch a specific pay TV channel. And primarily it's been to, um, excuse me, to uh, broadcast football. And it's had mixed results. I mean, we see just last week alone that Telefoot, that's a, that's a billion plus dollar collapse. And what that means for the what that means for the French football league teams, bankruptcies, loans, player transfers, fans, the trickle down effects touch every single piece of it. But then we see in other markets where it's actually really done well. Argentina, for example, or Thailand, where Octagon just represented the Thai FA and the Thai Premier League, helping them close nearly a four hundred million dollar landmark deal with a new pop-up pay TV channel and some complimentary free to air. So it's an entirely new way of looking at going to market. Uh, I'm sure many of you probably saw the news today. Players will start protesting in the super league over some failed stalled payments, broadcast payments from BN and Digiter. What impact does that have on all of those elements we just discussed? I would argue probably the greatest. If we look at the next slide, Jeff. So continuing with the, with the trends that we're watching, this pay TV shift, so people cutting the cord, never buying cable, the impact that that has starting at cable subscriptions down to advertisers, down to content acquisition spend is enormous. 
And while many are, when I say many, many networks, many media companies are getting with the OTT trend, are starting to launch their own digital streaming platforms, the revenue is still not there. So we see the next five years, five to six years of this balance, whereby leagues and teams are going to need to walk both lines. They're going to have to remain where the eyeballs are, which is still on pay TV and free to air. But as that number dwindles, they're going to make sure they have to make sure the smart ones that they are on streaming platforms. There's a couple of different ways to achieve that. Jeff, if we could go to the next one. This again, just talks about the, I mean, look at the last 15 years where the type of uh, audience aggregation is on television. It's, it's, 43 of the top 50 sports um, programs, excuse me, programs speaking in the U.S. last year were were sports uh, properties. This year alone, we've got 48 of the top 50 are just NFL games. So uh, on to the next one. This is getting back to that earlier point about walking that balance of having to be on big free to air and pay TV channels where audience still subscribes and tunes in, but where the audience is moving onto the OTT platform. Next one, Jeff. So how do you do that? Well, there's a there's really almost endless ways. In the OTT space, there's, there's really three forms of, of platforms right now, SVOD and AVOD, subscription video on-demand services, similar to a cable subscription that you pay for, and AVOD, advertising video on-demand, whereby there's no paywall, but you're going to get a bunch of ads thrown at you. And that's how that platform recovers that money. So we're starting to see a lot of our clients and teams and leagues across the world straddle different types of OTT platforms. Jeff, the next one. And then, as I mentioned before, there's alternatives to working with a, with a platform like Facebook or Netflix or Google or Amazon or MyCujo or DAZN. Some are going at it themselves. And that's what we call D to C, direct to consumer. So you're going to work with a technology company, for example, Delta Trade, perhaps, or New Line, Endeavor Streaming, some of the bigger streaming companies in the world. And you're going to go direct to consumer. The upfront cost is pretty significant. Technology changes rapidly, as we all know. So there's an ongoing cost there. But the benefit is the direct relationship you have with your fan. The amount of information that you can glean, when does this fan tune in? What teams does this fan watch? For how long does this fan watch? From where in the world is this fan watching? When does this fan tune in, tune out? And then you start to tie in other elements such as e-commerce, click and buy, click and click, uh, bet and watch. All of these other elements that as a direct to consumer, you can create a 360 degree view of who this fan is and then into Jeff's world, many of yours on the brand side, you can start to tap into your brand sponsorships and really give them targeted information with who they are talking to. Next one, Jeff. So of course it wouldn't be a media rights uh, presentation without talking about the impact that social media has had as well. And social media, not just from a, a marketing perspective. Social media has now become a, a critical way that fans all over the world consume sports league and sport team content. And so that's why Nielsen, a global monitor, um, Eurodata, another one, that's why they're coming out now with what we call total audience delivery metrics. Because just capturing how many fans are watching on TV does not capture the true audience essence anymore. And I would argue that what you'll see over the next decade is a greater audience share that will be watching, consuming, or engaging with a piece, piece of sports content on a digital or social platform more so than they would on a linear platform. Highlights, clips, we call it the highlight industrial complex. It's a fancy way of saying the entire value chain is being thrown on its head. The amount of time spent 
on social media consuming highlights of UEFA Champions League is growing at a 3x multiple of the audience that's watching a full game of Champions League on a pay TV or free to air network. So the impact that social media is having in terms of consumption behavior and access to content and that snackable content, which is becoming more the norm of the next generation of sports fans, is really an important area that we watch. Jeff, the next one. This is, I love to call this, this uh, slide the confusogram. We've tried to make it as least confusing as possible, but this, these are all the players. Actually, this is a microcosm of the U.S. of all the players in this space. So when we talk about the challenging times ahead for especially tier two properties, tier three properties, right? The properties that are not the Super League in Turkey, where rights fees are flattening or perhaps being put behind a paywall and decrease in some of those fees. While the rich get richer, the middle class, the lower class, they're, they're, they're getting hurt. But there's more outlets than ever before to get your content heard and to get your content exposed. It's all in the decision making and the marketing and the promotion behind that content that's really going to push these tier two and tier three properties forward. Sorry, next one, Jeff. Okay, I think we're coming to an end. And again, it's an apology. I didn't have, I didn't have enough time for the team to pull up all of the Turkish uh, media rights, Turkey-based uh, leagues and teams. But uh, looking at the U.S., we are still incredibly bullish on the growth globally as well of media rights. We think that media rights, as they become the number one revenue driver for leagues and teams starting in 2018, we project it'll be a, a plus $60 billion business uh, within the next two years. In the U.S. alone, as you, as you see here, we're talking about over the last decade a 300% increase in fees. But it's important to remember that as the pandemic has accelerated a lot of these trends, cord cutting, digital spending increasing, linear spending decreasing, that the, the, the tier one properties will continue to grow at a faster clip than the tier two and tier three. And that really poses some challenges for these properties. And they have to lean in, they have to take advantage of the technology platforms that will continue to sustain them, get smarter on social, find their audiences, using some of these advertising and marketing analytics and tools that Jeff and his team have at, at bay to make sure that they're capturing and retaining that audience if not growing. I think that wraps it up for me. Amir? Yes. Um, Daniel, Jeff. Well, um, actually, you just used the time uh, to its last minute, last second. And uh, we are out of time, but um, I would just like to wrap up um, because Jeff you shared uh, incredible projects um, with MasterCard and with Cisco. Uh, I was actually part of uh, one of the MasterCard chaperone activations in the Super Cup. So I know how that is important for them. So how they engage with their customer, uh, consumer base. It's an amazing adaptation of uh, the current circumstances to your existing assets and inventories with the uh, UEFA. Uh, it's brilliant. Uh, and uh, Cisco, I think it's amazing. It's beautiful. You know, even though the circumstances change, I think uh, we as agencies find ways to adapt the brand to the new circumstances throughout the way. I think this is how uh, we navigate. Uh, and Daniel, uh, thank you for sharing the amazing uh, information about the global landscape of the media rights. I believe there, there are a lot more uh, for brands that they will have amazing opportunities in these new, uh, new um, platforms uh, or digitally. Um, I, I believe it's going to be in a, it's going to be a different level. So, uh, Jeff, Daniel, we are here on Brand and Sport um, 
stage uh, and in the virtual stage. Um, I would like to get your opinion about one thing. I think it's really important. So sports has been an integral part of brands in communication. Uh, they use sports in their um, major communication activities. From this point onwards, what is your projection about the position of sports in the brand's world from e both of you's perspective? Blah, blah. Jeff. You want me to go first, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't think sports going anywhere. Um, I, I, think, I think at the end of the day, uh, most brands that we work with are, are aware of the fact that most consumers are far more passionate about the teams, clubs that they love than, than most brands. And so this, this idea of drafting off of the equity uh, of that fan passion and that fan love for, for the clubs and the teams isn't, isn't going anywhere anytime soon. What that looks like, um, what's going to be required of brands in terms of the continued flexibility and the ability to, to shift into more digital uh, and social content areas is is definitely going to be a, a theme that we're going to see continue into the future. But uh, I don't I don't expect sports. I, I would go the other way. I would say the pent up demand for the live experience is going to make 21 uh, a, a really really fun year once once the vaccine gets out and about. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. What about you, Daniel? Yeah, um, yeah I, I I completely agree with Jeff. And, and if you think about it this way, if you're from a brand's perspective. There's only two things that matter on television anymore, and it's news and it's sports. I mean, we some of our analysis just in the first half of the year for the U.S. saw that 498 million hours of sports content was consumed. Just take a step back and you think about that, and you and you position that against the news cycle, which is. In hyperdrive, because here in the U.S. we had a presidential election, we have ongoing 24-hour news with a pandemic. So th those two, are, that's it. That's where a brand has to be. They have to. They have to walk those two. And sometimes news is not going to be right because it's so politicized. So sport really is the bastion, the safe place for a brand to continue to activate it. And what excites me is that as sports become online, uh, come back online more there's more places to engage with sports. There's so many other distribution outlets, as I mentioned, between social and digital television that brands have access to fans now in ways that they've never had. And especially on the digital side, they have access to data and information. The amount of time that Jeff and his team spend analyzing, building strategy for brands based on this overwhelming amount of digital fan identification so that that brand can be very targeted and specific and who they're reaching and the message they're they're putting out there is exciting and it's only going to get bigger and there's only going to be more digital platforms and only more data for jeff and his team to have to go figure out and walk a brand through great um thank you for your amazing answers and taking the time to share all of the information you just shared um, under the circumstances we had you in our virtual world, hopefully in future we will have the privilege to host you at our stage in person. In, in, so thank you for the time uh, and uh, please stay safe uh, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Amir. Thank you very much. Happy holidays.